Law enforcement suicides are at an all-time high right now. One of the causes is poor leadership within the law enforcement profession. Nick, the host of the Roll Call Room podcast, has written a book, Police Mental Barricade, A Survivor's Guide to Poor Law Enforcement Leadership. This book is a raw and powerful look into suicide and how poor leadership decisions contribute to law enforcement suicides. Buy the book now at mentalhealthbarricade.com and stop the stigma. The issues discussed on the Roll Call Room podcast do not reflect the opinions of any specific agency. Any characters discussed on this show may be fictional for comedic value unless you're a shitbag Steve. This podcast is rated explicit and listener discretion is advised. about what it takes to be on one side of a door in Iraq or anywhere, knowing on the other side of the door, people who are not afraid of you, they're ready for you to come in and you still have, and they have guns, and you still have to breach that door. That's, that's a great question. It, it, that's a very scary situation when you are on one side of the door and your mind is racing because on the other side of that door, it could be no one. It could be four guys with four AK-47s. That, that door you're about to open could be booby-trapped. So once you open it, boom, your legs are gone. So there's a thousand things you think about when you're the first guy, second guy, third guy, getting ready to go in a room and flood it. You're lucky that you don't have to think like warriors think. I chose this world, but the mentality of a warrior is very different than the normal mentality. You must be that person on that door, open, getting ready to open it, thinking to yourself, if I die, so be it. The only way you can go in that door is knowing there's a great chance you're going to die. It's like being a SEAL, you train with live ammo. You jump out of an airplane. Every, 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 everything you do, you could die. Being a warrior takes a whole different mindset. A whole different mindset to know that there's a great chance I may not be in the military. Like I was in for 21 years. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky that I'm alive, able to talk to you, able to still run. But when you sign up on that dial line to be a set, you know, like a SEAL, your mentality changes. I may not live. You gotta accept that. But I'm also looking at the guys to my left and to my right, realizing that uh, we're here together, man. And I have to, uh, I have to be strong for them. And they gotta be strong for me. You, you really out there fight for that guy beside you. And you can't be a coward. Winning affects people in two ways only. One, it makes them fucking lazy. It makes them complacent. It makes them not want to get up in the morning and work hard. It makes them not want to do the personal development that they did to get there. It makes them not want to pay attention to the details. It makes them let things that used to matter a lot start to matter a little. They just kind of go away. Why do they go away? Because they took their eye off the fucking ball. Because them winning a little makes them lazy. Right? But then you have the second group. You have the second group which they don't do it for the money. They don't do it for the fucking cars. They don't do it for the house. They're not doing it for the stats. They're doing it because they're like a fucking shark. They get one little sniff of the blood. They get one little taste of the blood and they're going all the fuck in for the win. There's, these motherfuckers aren't playing for the dollar bills. They're not playing for the fancy cars. They're not playing for the big titty bitches. They're not playing for the glory. They're playing for the fucking blood. And people who play for the fucking blood, who play for the fucking win, who go all in on every single detail, even more when they start to win. These people are the people who fucking win. These are the people who get to the top and nobody can ever dethrone them because they still believe that they're not shit. Hello and welcome to the Roll Call Room podcast, the podcast that pissed shitbag Steve's off and fucked over my dad. And now your host and my daddy, 
Nick. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to an episode of the Roll Call Room Podcast. My name is Nick, one of your hosts, and my co-host for the evening is... Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? (laughs) Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? (laughs) Mikey, Mike, how are you doing today? Doing good. Tired. Yeah. Doing good. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Well, let me, let me tell you something. Uh, a little a little behind the scenes for you folks. We talked about it in Shots Fired. You know, we never, um, we typically, I don't want to say never, we typically do not record the beginning um, after we've already done the episode. Uh, but because the schedules being what they are um, and the guests that you're about to listen to, which hands down, in the history of Roll Call Room podcast, unless um, a U.S. president comes on the show or somebody else that I've been working on comes on the show so far. And thus, this is no dig on any former guests that we have. We love you all. But you have to agree, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman is the um, guru when it comes to warrior mindset in law enforcement and military. I think we could agree to that, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Grossman or um, Dave, he let me call him Dave, bro. The whole like theme from I had like I had an instant Woody because I was like, "What do I call you, Colonel Grossman, Lieutenant Colonel?" He goes, "You call me Dave, Nick." And I went, "Oh, oh, oh my god! I just uh, what am I dreaming?" And um, off air. He talked to me like outside of the interview and he was like, um, he was like, I told him about my book. I said I was inspired by Travis Yates and him. And, you know, he was like, uh, I swear to you, Mike, I I taped it too. I have it so I can relive this. Uh, he was like, you want me to write a forward for your book? And I was like, are are you kidding? Like I I was like fangirl. And I was like, "Are, are you kidding? He's like, yeah, send me over the manuscript. Tell me what the book is about. I would be honored to write the for the forward to your book. So I've got Travis Yates, Ernie from Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops, and now the Lieutenant Colonel Grossman writing the forward to my book. You still don't have me. No. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. Because the forward. But what are you okay. eating? What are you eating? I am eating a Valentine's Day. <laughs> Peanut butter heart from Reese's. Come on, man. It is. I found it on clearance. Um, And the expiration date on this is best to be eaten by March 1st, 2020. So. Yeah. Good job. No wonder wonder why I was on clearance. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so good. Um, You know, see, the thing is, is I would have you write a forward for the book. I don't want to do it anymore. But. I'm I just don't think that we're doing donations to St. Jude's kids. Oh, pal. Oh. All right. All right. Uh, you know, I'm learning to be a little bit more politically correct. Um, I apologize for that remark. Um, <laughs> I think it was uncalled for, and I'd like to make a statement that uh, I will not do that again, and I apologize. Please forgive me. Um, but <laughs> this... Uh, <laughs> This episode that you're about to listen to, I asked Lieutenant Colonel Grossman whether or not he can, um, can, you know, how much time can I have with him? Because I just had so many, I have five pages of questions from fans and I had to narrow it down to the ones that made the most sense for the current climate of what we're going through. And guy, such a stand up guy that he was like, why don't we do three episodes? And I was like, I was like, Colonel, I'll do two. Because two is, ex- I mean, you're talking about two hours of nonstop talking. Um, and I did like five hours of research the night before. 
And, um, you know, I called you, you were working and I called you and I texted you and I said, Hey, you going to jump on this? Cause you finally got days off. You know, the, your jurisdiction finally allowed you to have days off and you're like, yeah, dude, I'll jump on it. I'll jump on it. And, you know, the interview was at 10 AM and, um, you know, nine o'clock I text you. I'm like, Hey, you getting you up, you ready? Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. Um, 10, uh, nine 15 text message. Nothing. We're going into full Steve mode. Full fuck. Full steam ahead. Full steam ahead. <laughs> full steam ahead. Choo choo. <laughs> I, jumped, I get nine fifty two. I'm like yo, yo. I get, I get the text. Yo, too late. So let's just say, take a bite. Take a bite of the heart. Let Let's just say, uh, about eleven fifteen, twelve o'clock. I kind of sort all the text messages and missed calls. Yeah. Well, and then at that point, cause we were still going on, we were still recording till about one at that point. That's like showing up to a bachelor party with a hooker <laughs> and everybody's already had a turn. What's the point? <laughs> so I did the right thing. I didn't, I didn't join. Uh, in. You definitely did the right thing. You didn't join in because I could tell from that guy's demeanor. Oh, uh, I would have had a, I would have fucking had to do push ups. Oh, <laughs> burpees burpees bro oh forget it. I, i'd be dead i'd be dead and i'll tell you something and you you folks will see this in the interview that is an intense guy that guy knows his shit yeah listen I, I missed it i apologize but you let me listen to uh some some of it yeah amazing yeah amazing i appreciate that you know um eventually you know you'll get to the point where you actually appreciate the fans and put in some sort of effort to the show um, <laughs> fuck you we at, least, we at least got you to stop fucking unraveling to, uh a tinfoil behind you um and having your dog uh barking in the background and i think at one point you had a marching band practicing in the background um you're getting it i mean you know eventually you'll have some respect for these fans that tune in Okay. All right. <laughs> um, you know, you yelled at me. I sneezed or I coughed. And you're like, you know, uh, you oh, know the, yeah. yeah. You're like, you know, uh, no, when you called me afterwards, you're like, you know, uh, these microphones, they're out there, you know, they're pretty good microphones. Uh, you can uh, fucking hear everything. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, felt like I was at the principal's office. I was like, well, get berated okay. by it. You know, the thing is, is you never listen to yourself ever in, in history. Like you, when the words come out of your mouth, they're done, they're over. You never hear them again, unless unless you're in the court of law or unless you're you're up in I, I, I getting interviewed about some false claims that are made against you. Wink, wink. And then you get to listen to the audio later on. Um, but when you listen to yourself, you start to realize what things you do that are just really annoying like for yourself like for me the first like five episodes every five every five seconds i would sniff in uh or um yeah or um like every well, you, five, you know you know you, dude go ahead you're that's another thing you gotta you gotta reprimand me about no no, no, I'm, no, no, no you did you did i'm having norcal she's gonna she's gonna she is gonna count how many times you said you know because it's so many ma- it's so many dude in um what episode was it what was your what was the episode before um shots fired oh you just yell at me uh th- you just sinking ship sinking ship sinking ship oh sinking ship um every other word was you know you know you know you know so but folks listen uh i want you to enjoy this episode um listen to what lieutenant colonel grossman has to say all right and uh folks we'll see you on the next one Still run for the hills. Yeah. My good contribution in the opening. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You had to bring up, uh, you know, my kiddos. 98% of the work. Yeah. I love the fans. I'm not not even show up. Bro, you you were still recording, man. Come on. Fuck. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in and welcome back from break. Uh, it is my pleasure to have Lieutenant Colonel Grossman, uh, Dave Grossman, on the show. I've been looking forward to this, uh, to this for a long time. Um, 
Lieutenant Colonel Gro- Grossman has given me the uh, the honor to just call him Dave going forward. So before I get any hate emails that I I stripped his title and only called him Dave, he has given me the permission to just call him Dave. So my former military folks and my police um, fans out there, relax. I've got the approval. Okay. Um, I do want to. Uh, I do. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dave, for coming on. But before I turn it over to you. Uh, I do want to give a brief history of uh, Dave. Uh, For those of you that have been living under a rock in the law enforcement profession and you haven't read any of his books, shame on you, first of all. Uh, And those of you in our civilian world, specifically our live PD fans, uh, I want to give you a little brief history of of Dave. Uh, His his career includes service in the U.S. Army as a sergeant in the 82nd Airborne Division, a a platoon leader in the 9th Infantry Division, a general staff officer, a company commander in the 7th Light Infantry Division, as well as a paratrooper and a graduate of the of Ranger School. He went on to become a professor of, professor of philosophy at oh, oh. Uh, psychology, sorry, psychology <laughs> <laughs> at West Point. Oh. Uh, in February 1998, Grossman retired from the military as a professor of military science at Arkansas State University. And uh, one of the notable things as a civilian that he did was he um, was an expert witness uh, in uh, Timothy McVeigh's case, which we'll talk about later on if he's comfortable with that. Uh, Dave, it is an absolute honor. I was telling you before we hit record, uh, I was. In- uh, so, um, Dave, it's an honor to have you on. I, I will give you a brief history. Um I was an academy recruit back uh, in my law enforcement agency here in Virginia, and there was an instructor uh, that was very, very heavily into the warrior mindset, uh, sheep, uh, sheepdog mentality, um, and um, really didn't know what he was talking about because I was a civilian. So sheep, wolves, and sheepdog mentality. And I was a civilian, and I was like, what is this guy talking about? And he recommended one of your books. And uh, I immediately bought your book and I was reading it feverishly. Um, And it was an eye opener as a police recruit to read your books because um, they not only are for military personnel, but but perfect for law enforcement personnel. So I wanted to thank you for that. It's my honor to be of service to all of these uh, great sheepdogs out there. And and, uh, certainly in this dark hour, we're we're seeing our sheepdogs come over under intense uh, attack. Uh, A friend of mine talks about it as uber sheep. <laughs> you know, you know, be careful the metaphor. Yeah. It's just a model, it's just a metaphor, but it rings true. I actually have the trademark, uh, U.S. government trademark for the term sheepdog as protector. And people have embraced it. It's just a model to kind of recognize it, but there truly are people out there who, who don't have the capacity for violence. And it's the vast majority of our citizens. You know, uh, people point some horrible crime and say, ah, that, that proves we're all killers. No, that's an outlier. It's literally one in a million. You explain to me the 99.9% of our citizens will go a lifetime, never kill anybody, or even seriously attempt to. Divorce, infidelity, layoff, traffic accidents, and, 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 and only a tiny fraction of a percent in a lifetime of provocation will even seriously attempt to take a human life. Explain that. Inside, inside most healthy members of our species, there's this hardwired resistance against killer all kinds. Sociopaths don't have that resistance. Healthy people have to be trained to use deadly force. And, and that's what my book on killing was all about. My first book, a half million copies sold worldwide, uh, translated eight languages, Marine Corps Commandant's required reading. And, you know, recently I've come under a lot of attacks and uh, along with law enforcement as America's number one law enforcement trainer, you know, it's been hard for cops, it's been hard for me, but you can really tell a hit piece versus journalism when they don't mention my mm-hmm. books. You know, if they mention the book, somebody yes. might buy the book and decide for themselves. Now, here's all this attack about this and that and doesn't once mention the book. You're not looking at journalism. And when these attacks happen on our cops, you know, you're not looking at journalism here. You're not looking at people trying to solve the problem. Uh, you, you're looking at, at a left-wing agenda uh, to create chaos and breakdown of our civilization. And, and you are the sheepdog. Now, you know, the, the wolf has capacity for violence and no empathy. And, and that's a good definition of a, of a sociopath or a psychopath, potential for violence and no empathy. But what if you had a capacity for violence? You'd nurtured the capacity for violence 
and desire to protect. And then you got a sheepdog. And you know, and, and we know if the sheepdog turns his fangs on, on the sheep, even once, he's gone. Uh, you know, we, we can't tolerate that. And, and we're functioning in that realm. And yet there are people out there now that are, that, that are, that are trying to tear down our nation and tear down our way of life. And, uh, and everybody out there, you got to believe in who you are, believe in what you do. Things will come back the other way with a, with a passion. But yeah, the, the sheep, the wolf, the sheepdog model took off. I, I mentioned in just a sentence and on killing. Uh, and then the follow one book was on combat. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I was a young paratrooper, 82nd Airborne Division. It was early and mid 1970s. We had Vietnam veterans all around us. And we wanted to know what combat was going to be like. And they wouldn't say. It was like this taboo topic. So fast forward a decade, I'm a young infantry captain uh, going to grad school en route to teach at West Point, uh, Army Ranger, Hama Hama. And I started conducting interviews about killing. And, and, and they would tell me, and you know, it's really a weird dynamic. I, I think that how could we have had 500 years of gunpowder combat? And not have anybody come up and say, you know, the shots get muted in combat. I think the people that are there have enormous difficulty talking about it. And I make the analogy in my book to sex. You know, if if somebody came up to you and said, hey, man, how's the sex life going? How's it been doing? What you, You'd blow them off. But a Masters and Johnson, a scholarly, you know, with, with good credentials comes and asks, you, you might tell them. And they might discover things that nobody ever knew before. And that's what happens on killing. And I thought... At the heart of combat was the act of killing. And what I came to realize was, after vast interviews, vast numbers of people, for those who fully prepared themselves, you know, killing's not that big a deal, a lawful, legitimate killing. But, but it was the other stuff, auditory exclusion, tunnel vision, slow motion time, memory gaps. Those meet mm. every definition of a psychotic episode. The normal human response to a life and death event meets every definition of a psychotic episode. And that's what was blowing people's minds. And that was the core. And then afterwards, and you know, when and I, I talk about how the body responds to life and death event, we got sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, and then parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, also called feed and breed. And so in a life and death event, boom, it's all fight or flight. Digestion, you got dry mouth. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite of salivation. You know, when we're when we're when we're we're in uh, feed and breed, uh, you know, rest and digest. You see food, you salivate. When your life and death event, you get dry mouth. It's the opposite ends of the spectrum. But when the danger is over, then there's a backlash in the opposite direction to to rest and digest, feed and breed. A lot of people talk about gorging themselves after a after a traumatic event. And and I tell people, fire, EMS, victims of violent crime, they talk about the same backlash and. You know, it, it's called feed and breed for a reason. A lot of people talk about having a really intense sexual response, and it scares them. I tell people this is normal. And, and you know, I, uh, I had somebody videotape my presentation. I thought they were straight up people. And, uh, and they took that section where I talk about that backlash of, of, of this sex and about how people talk about having intense sex, and, and it scares them. And, uh, and I tell them there's not a lot of perks to come to this job. You know, don't worry about it. It's normal. Don't worry if it doesn't happen. Relax and enjoy it. And off duty. Wait till you're off duty. So that's <laughs> yeah, a good yeah. laugh. You know, not a lot of perks. You know, and and laughter means learning. Laughter means I've got this. I embrace this. I understand this. Laughter is one of the key components in in learning process. So they they videotaped this section of what I was talking about, and then they they cut out all the references to anybody else. Fire, EMS, victims of crime. They cut out all the parts saying there's nothing wrong if it doesn't happen. They cut out the part saying it scares people and you need to be forewarned and forearmed. And 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 you look at the video, it says, well, Grossman says you're gonna have great sex after you kill somebody. And, and look at look uh. at the video on that. Every time they cut to the audience, they're cutting me. Every time they cut back to me, they're making another cut. They cut back to the, now we know a quote out of context can be very deceptive. You take a quote and you cut it and you cut it and you cut it and then you switch the order around. It's a lie of enormous magnitude. And, I, and that's the kind of attacks that we're yeah, facing I, when we talk about simple biological dynamics and, and the, the attacks that we're facing on this. But it's about warning people about these biological processes that they're normal and most important of all. 
you expect crazy things in the heat of battle. A week later, a gunshot mm-hmm. goes off. I didn't expect it. Your heart is pounding. You go on to fight or flight. A- and that is what people don't expect. It scares the daylights out of them as they go on that roller coaster ride again. It is not PTSD. It's normal. It can become PTSD when when you go on that roller coaster ride and you try to not think about it. You will literally drive yourself crazy trying to not think about it. You have to make peace with the memory. So that was my book on combat. That's what was at the core. When we peeled away the first layer of the onion on killing, which is which is a useful book, it's academic, a Google Scholar. Google Scholar says the book has been cited over 2,800 times in scholarly journals. I mean, truly one of the great scholarly works of our time. But I will tell you, far more important is on combat. And we peel away the layer of the onion. So that's kind of my process. My most recent book just came out like two weeks ago is on spiritual combat. When you peel away the last layer of the onion, I really believe that we've got to understand that we're in a fight against forces of evil. I think every cop has looked straight in the eyes of evil. You know Mm -hmm. there's evil in the world. You can't deny it. And if you know there's evil, and you don't have a force for good on your side, it's going to make the battle awful rough. We we got to we got to call upon forces of good. This this on spiritual combat, and and if there is a force for good, it's always been there. It's not hiding under a rock somewhere. It's it's the one that's been there that's had the greatest success. And and I, I'm a, I come from that traditional uh, uh, Christian background, and it came around to understanding that. And this this final layer of the onion is at the core is this battle between good and evil. That's what we're looking at right now. Forces of evil trying to destroy. They burn, they destroy, they loot. They, they, they want to get rid of all cops, which is, which is biblically just completely inappropriate. And, and, uh, and, and, and so I, I, I haven't, haven't dug my way down to that level in my progress from the sheepdog. I talk about, about the sheepdog on the authority of the great shepherd. And one day the sheepdog will rest at the feet of the great shepherd and we yearn to hear those sounds. Yeah, we, we yearn to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I, and I tell people, you know, uh, now that I've ever written that book, I've been on the road 23 years uh, uh, teaching cops, military, and and at every, all 50 states. I think I'm the only law enforcement trainer post-certified in all 50 states, every federal agency, including the, the Postal Service and, yeah, and Postal Investigators and the Diplomatic Security Service and the gun toters in the IRS. I've trained them all. And after it's all said and done, and, and I'm 63 years old, uh, I pray I can do it for another 20 years. But I, I, I think I've hit this point where I can say, you know, I, 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 I've come to the core of the matter. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm going to keep up the good fight, but uh, the, the great shepherd could take me home tomorrow. I wouldn't have think complain about it. I tell everybody, if I get there first, I'll save you a place by the fire. <laughs> well, I, w- I want to touch on a couple of things. And, and you know, when I made the announcement that I was going to have you on the show, um, I told you before we came on, I've got I got at least 400 messages from folks. Hey, um, congratulations you know, on that, Nick. 120 listeners. Wow. 120,000. Yeah. Well done, my brother. Yeah. Well done. I'm so proud for you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I, I uh, you know, I I started this show with a with a co-host in October of last year. So from October to now, one hundred and twenty thousand listeners, and um, it's all about mental health within our law enforcement profession. And then, um, you know, folks like yourself and folks like Travis Yates, who wrote a, a, a really good book as well, uh, inspire me to write my own book. And I just finished my book. Now it's in editing. And um, Dave, you can tell everybody the editing part is probably the most stressful part of writing a book. I just want to get it out, but you know the editor is like uh, edits everything. So, um, so I'm excited about my book getting out. It's nowhere near the the books that you've written, but I will tell you, it is all about poor leadership within law enforcement and what the difficulties are. Um, I want to touch on. Before we spoke, I said I put out that I was going to have you on 400 responses um, at least and only one negative one. And when I and I touch on what you said, which was I said, did you did you actually read any of his books other than going on Google and taking excerpts from any of his books? And the answer was no. And then that person like 
like ghosted themselves on Facebook, which is hilarious. But I want to touch on, do you think, do you think maybe some of the issues that we're currently having in society as a whole, when it comes to law enforcement is the sheeps have been graced with the reduction in crime and the reduces of the wolves. And now the sheepdogs are taking the brunt of the great work from the sheepdogs, the, the fantastic job of reducing crime. And the sheep no longer live in fear. They no longer live in high crime, high homicide rates. And they have forgotten about yeah. the wolves. Um, to, to, to quote your books, to quote the philosophy from your books. Um, do you, do you feel you know, that I, way? I think that's part of the equation, something even deeper and terribly important. You know, I, I, uh, I've been the guest presenter at over a hundred universities and colleges. I, uh, you know, I speak at national, international psych conferences and it, 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 I'm, I'm like the guest criminal justice presenter, right? They get CJ day at this college. They got all the CJ instructors, all the alumni, all the students say, open it up to local law enforcement. And I say, I begin by saying the field of criminal justice is absolutely flawed because how do we measure crime? Oh, the murder rate. The murder rate completely misrepresents the situation because the docs are saving ever more lives all the time. It's not so much that uh, cops are better. We have cameras, we have DNA analysis, we have, we have all these tools of technology. But the first step is understanding how medical technology is holding down the murder rate. If we had World mm -hmm. War II level medical technology in Iraq today, we would have at least 10 times many dead American troops. And the same thing is true in our mm -hmm. streets. If we had Vietnam level medical technology in Afghanistan today, we would have at least four times many dead American troops. And the same thing is true in our streets. So we got one solid data point right around the year 2000, a UMass Harvard study says if we had 1970s medical technology, the murder rate would be three to four times what it is. And think about it, that data is 20 years old. In the last 20 years, the leaps and bounds of life-saving technology is astounding. Tourniquets alone. You know, I'd ask my audience, how many all carry tourniquets? <laughs> Every hand goes up. How many carried tourniquets 10 years ago? <laughs> Nobody hand goes up. One medical expert tells me that he believes tourniquets alone have cut the murder rate in half in just a decade. Cops slaps on a tourniquet, saves a life, we prevented a murder. If just 20 to 30 cops a day slap on a tourniquet, and EMS, everybody else carrying tourniquets out, the guys like me, we've cut the murder rate in half. The, the, the situation is much, much worse than it looks. I had the uh, I, I was I visited the White House as part of the president's roundtable on media violence and. Uh, violent video games. And that's when they began to attack me when I gave the president a copy of my book, Assassination Generation. I was invited just to, just to last August to the White House again to brief the vice president. I told the vice president, you know, we have inflation adjusted dollars. Anytime we talk about money, we've got to say how much that equates to in today's dollars. And, and if we don't do that, we're lying. And anytime we talk about the murder rate, we have to have medically adjusted murder. And it will absolutely rock our world. So first, understand the homicide rate has exploded in just the last couple, three years. And people aren't even aware of it. But if we allow for how much worse it will be if not for medical technology, it's crazy. And so, yes, the sheepdog are holding back the tide. But the tide is far greater than we've ever seen. People say, oh, it's all hunky-dory out there. It's not. It's far, far worse. You know, it is not normal for children to commit multiple homicides in their schools. It's never happened in human history. Mm -hmm. Now it's everywhere. People say, oh, it's only happened in America. No, it's not. Read my book, Assassination Generation. Truly understand the magnitude of the threat. Uh, children are committing crimes worldwide like nothing we've ever seen before. And people come into our classrooms and slaughtering our children in Dunblane, Scotland. I told the vice president, I hope I'm wrong. I pray that I'm wrong. Every step of the way I predicted what was coming, I'll tell you what's coming next. We're going to see daycare maskers. We're going to see school bus maskers. We're going to see somebody plow through those kids in front of the schools at a vehicle 100 miles an hour. Don't wait for it to happen. Move those kids now. Put out those bollards now. Or if some mom is shaking off her Ambien and hits the gas pedal instead of the brake and plows through the kids, 
How do we prevent that now? The security in our daycares, just like our schools, apply the same lesson. Training our school bus drivers. These are things we can be doing right now. But there is there is evil coming at us 100 miles an hour. I pray that I'm wrong when you hear about that daycare massacre. One happened in Belgium. Many happened in, in China. It's just a matter of time. You hear about the school bus massacre. We just had a busload of kids lit on fire in Italy. 41 kids on board with bus soaked with gas and torched off in Italy. Not a single life was lost. Many badly burned. Uh, a lot of lessons from that example. And, you know, and, and, and Google, Italian school bus hijacked. And it'll come right up. And you know what? Six months after that incident, I briefed uh, uh, FDNY, Fire Department New York. And, uh, and we had the chief of their counterterrorism department. Had he never heard of the incident? A school was full of Italian kids, soaked with gas, and, and not a single kid died. The Italians were brilliant. There's a lesson to learn. Many kids badly burned. But it, it was completely censored. I said, so why wasn't this the news? And, and, and so understand that things are much, much worse than they look. The people who are responsible for giving us the information, the media, the academics, they are deeply invested in everything's hunky-dory out there. You don't have to worry. And, and there is a misrepresentation that everything's hunky-dory. It's not. It's bad. It's going to get worse. And when the American public fully begins to understand it, uh, there will be a backlash in the opposite direction. Anytime you create this, this bizarre, artificial, anti-cop dynamic, it, it's pitting in the wind. You can piss in the wind <laughs> for a little bit, but then it's coming back at you. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, uh, two, two things. Um, I'm writing, I'm writing notes feverishly, Dave, as you talk, I feel like I'm back in the Academy. I really do. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think a lot of the problem, two things, I think a lot of the problem is, is the reason why we're not preparing for those things that you're talking about is the optics. And if COVID taught us anything in law enforcement, many law enforcement agencies gave orders to their troops not to wear masks in public because of the optics, not to scare the public. And I think our profession, law enforcement profession, has been reactionary for so, so long that a domestic terrorism is and soft targets are right around the corner because we fail to to overshadow the optics versus what's right. Putting barriers up around a nursery school or around schools, period. Who cares what the optics are? Paint the barriers with with there flowers you if you want. Paint them. You know, what paint them with, yeah. yeah, paint them with pink or whatever you want. But now is the time for preparation. Now is the time we are in a different climate. The other thing is, is that I want to touch on is I believe, and I don't know whether or not you believe, that there are some agencies out there, some law enforcement agencies with such poor leadership that actually publicize those murder rates, knowing that they're incorrect because of the medical, the medical, um, um, the great medical things that we have now that are saving an example people. To, to reinforce that. Quite a few years back, maybe yeah. a decade back, uh, Chicago shut down one of the inner city trauma centers and the murder rate exploded. Now, they're not totally stupid. They opened a bunch of inner city trauma centers and brought the murder rate down. They know what's happening at one level and, and they're truly invested in misrepresenting it. You're, you're quite right. We can show you case studies. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I, I from experience, I've worked with a couple of local law enforcement agencies. Um, you know, they'll tote um, two homicides in one year and they'll 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 publicize that to the hilt. They'll, they'll publicize that, that they've done a fantastic job with only two murders. But in reality, because and it's funny that you talk about tourniquets, my law, my law enforcement agency only got tourniquets maybe three years ago. But we were using tourniquets left and right on people, saving lives almost on a semi-weekly basis where the homicide rate yeah. would have been from yeah. two to yeah, like just 20. that one factor. Well, all right, the other right. medical and, technology out there. Yes. Right. Right. And I think where we where we short fall where we fall short in the law enforcement community is, is that we're not focusing on the poor leadership up at the yeah. top. Yeah. Um leading these troops. And, um, you know, I think that's a big, big problem right now is, is that you have very, very poor leaders. You have peacetime leaders leading troops through wartime. Well, 
and this is important. Uh, you've got to understand that our leaders, law enforcement leaders, are political appointees. And, yes. and, and so they're simply a reflection of the politics you vote for. And, and, and I, I think there should, needs to be a lot more political activism. But I'll tell you the, the, the exception that proves the rule is our sheriffs. You know, I was working in England a while back. They said, oh, you guys elect your law enforcement leaders. I think I'm going to find some guy, elect him to be my doctor. I'll find some guy, elect him to be my dentist. And I said, well, you know, on one level, it, it sounds crazy. But on the other level, it really works. I tell them, you know, the police chief is a politician. He can be fired by any, any one of 20 people any day of the week. And, and, and he's appointed based on politics. The sheriff can only be fired by 51% of the voters every four years. And, and, and they represent the will of the people. And, uh, and, and not only that, but the will of the people in a broader area, not just a metropolitan area, but the broader rural areas. And, and any time you see liberals get control of a state, they, they either destroy sheriffs or they emasculate them. We see where sheriffs no longer have authority, sheriffs doing just little bitty jobs, you know, warrants and civil warrants and things like that. Now you look around and look at the liberal states. What have they done? You know, they, they're they solid on lockdown. You know, they're nanny state. We're going to lock you down when to save you. You know, we, they're, they're, they're enabling these riots and they're emasculating mm-hmm. our cops. And uh, and the first thing they do when they get power at the state level is is to emasculate our sheriffs, which is, which is really popular representation. So what you're talking about really is a political battle. It's, a, it's true. It's absolutely correct. They are politicians, and 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 then there's another problem out there. Uh, early on, 22 years ago, when I first started doing this, a, a law enforcement trainer talked to me about what he called the conspiracy of competence. He said the good guys in law enforcement will gravitate to training and special ops. He said you can spend your whole police career and never make a decision. The guy on the beat calls the sarge. You know the. The sergeant calls the lieutenant. The chief appoints a committee. You can spend your entire career never make a decision. He said, two people in this business, they got to stand up and accept responsibility. And that's law enforcement trainers and our tactical teams. You know, who do they call for when it comes to that? They've got to make the call themselves. And I've remembered that ever since, that this, this conspiracy of competence. And here's the point of that. Those are the people who need to try to get rank. I just want to be in the front lines for a lifetime. Man. Oh, yeah, we need you. You're the kind of guy that we need on those top ranks. You know, I just want to be on the tech team. I just want to be a law enforcement trainer. You know, I love what I do. I know you love it. But when you look up there and you look at the leadership and you see the failure of that leadership, a part of the voice ought to say, that's my fault. I should be, I should be testing for that slot. I should be bidding for that slot and try to get the good people to the top. You know, with all you cops out there listening to this, think about the one person with the education, the smarts, and they got their heart right. And take that person and say, you need to be running for leadership. You're the kind of guy that we need. Push that envelope. You know, number one, it's it's a reflection of our politics. But number two, it's a reflection of who we are. We don't want to play the political game. We don't want to have to do that stuff. It's a dirty, nasty job. But somebody needs to do it. Or who's going to rise to the yeah. top? Who's going to be the person that gets that job? But the good ones don't bid for it. And I'll tell you, you know, um, in my law enforcement career, that was the decision when I put in for sergeant and then for lieutenant was you cannot sit there and complain about an agency. if You're not willing to infiltrate the command staff. Uh, Great word. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, And I would have people that would work for me my troops underneath me when I was a sergeant and they were the big complainers. Oh, this place sucks, this, that, and this. And I would go, great, take the next sergeant's process. I don't want to do that. How are you going to change it if you don't change the culture? How are you going to, you have to infiltrate the command staff. You have to change. The dinosaurs have to retire out eventually. And the new beginning is coming for law enforcement. And I don't think a lot of, I don't think a lot of law enforcement officers think that for forward ahead. They're not thinking like that. But we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come right back uh, with Dave. Do you want to help the Roll Call Room podcast keep going? Of course you do. 
Join Patreon and pledge to the show each month. Tiers start at $5 and you could get some pretty cool shit with it, including swag and access to listen to episode clips early. So put that Starbucks coffee down and help my dad keep the show going. Don't be a fucking Steve. Go to RollCallRoom.com to pledge today. All right, folks, thank you for tuning in and welcome back from break. Uh, I want to get into some uh, fan questions. Uh, I know a lot of you submitted questions. So out of the 400 of you, um, Dave is not going to sit on Squadcast for 17 days answering all of these things. You can you can go at the end of his episode. He's going to plug um, some of his public appearances. You can go there uh, and watch him and ask your questions. But I did pick two really good questions that co- coincide with mental health for law enforcement. And Bart asks, uh, sleep deprivation, um, especially with law enforcement now with the riots um, and, um, you know, PTSD. Uh, we talked about PTSD um, and the effects on law enforcement, mental health, the, the sleep deprivation. What's your take on that, sir? You know, it, when I talk to cops, it is my number one topic. I talk to the American Sheriff's Association, talk to many chiefs association, and I beat them up. I tell them, look. We're now in a zero defects environment. We're like the airlines. The airlines cannot crash a single plane. Oh, come on. 40,000 traffic deaths a year, you know, 20,000 traffic accidents a day. One airline crash a day is reasonable. No. One, one airline crash a year. No. One every 10 years. No. You cannot crash a single plane. We will investigate you. We will find you. We may fire you. We might put you in jail. That's what zero defects looks like. I tell them we cannot have a single cop walk out that door and do something stupid or we will all pay a terrible price. I've been saying that for years. Mm-hmm. And, and and what we need to understand is the one giant, huge piece of low hanging fruit that we got to nail immediately is, is sleep. The military research tells us that sleep deprived people can be up to five times more likely to take their life. Sleep deprivation, one of the greatest predictors of suicide. Suicide is not a rational act. Every creature has a powerful drive to self-preservation. To take your life, is you have to have severely impaired judgment, and sleep deprivation creates impaired judgment. 18 hours without sleep, and your impaired judgment equal to 0.08 legally drunk. Mm. 24 hours without sleep, impaired judgment equal to 0.10 above legally drunk. So we know... Truck drivers are required to log in enough sleep, but the state trooper that pulls them over isn't. This should enrage us. Yeah. I'm doing interviews. I'm all these people attacking me and attacking cops, and they say they, you know, they, and and uh, I, I I tell them, look, there's a problem. It's something we can all agree on. Let's deal with sleep in law enforcement. They don't want to do that. If I were king and I could pass one law. That would mandate sleep for law enforcement. Unless it is a declared emergency, I will not put tired cops out on the road. And and I'm two million miles on Delta, a million on American Atlanta, and 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 and, and United. If if I get on a plane, they don't have arrested crew, they cancel the flight. I'm mm-hmm. good with that. Better no flight than a tired pilot. Better no cop than a tired cop. Right. If we, if I were king, I'd say again, it could pass one law. Mandate sleep for law enforcement. It is the greatest predictor of traffic deaths and suicide. The two major killers of our cops. And, and the third major killer that has exploded worldwide of our kids and our cops, suicide, traffic deaths, and drug overdoses. Yes. And sleep deprivation creates chronic pain. Why opiate epidemic? Why of all the drugs out there? Why worldwide are opiates and prescription opiates at least have always been there? Why are our opiates and prescription opiates on the drug of choice? Because we're in the middle of a civilization-wide epidemic of sleep deprivation. And we can no longer operate this way. We've got to be like airline pilots, air traffic controllers, nuclear power plant operators, tugboat operators, Amtrak engineers, ferryboat operators, and truck drivers, and, and dozens of other professions require a law getting enough sleep. And I interview with these people. I tell them, look, there's a problem. The, the, the incident that happened in Minneapolis. Did anybody ask if those two cops, if the cops had just come off a shift change and they all have jet lag? Anybody see if they were working a double or a triple and they were sleep deprived? Did anybody even ask the question? Bet you not. If an, if an airline crashes, they don't just investigate the pilot. 
They investigate the mechanic, they investigate the trainer, they investigate the supervisor, they investigate everybody. The entire chain of command needs to be held accountable. And if they put sleep deprived people on the street, they need to be held accountable. And I know this is hard. Then we won't have enough people. Then hire more and pay them more. And we will. We're a very rich nation. When things are wrong, we throw money at it. If you remember, if the public, in the last episode, we talked about how the, the crime is much worse than it looks. Medical technology is holding down the murder rate. Mm -hmm. If the public realized how very bad it is, and that's what's happening now, riots in our streets, cities being burned down, bad things happening, there will be a backlash in the opposite direction. And we'll throw money at this problem. The guy who decides whether or not to shoot your kid should be the best paid, best trained, best qualified guy on the planet. And it's not. And he's not. And, and we're going to fix that. And we're moving in that direction, have faith in our way of life. The, the dynamic that's coming in the opposite direction it, it is going to be of enormous magnitude as we swing back in a direction of sanity and justice and 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 dealing with criminals as, as criminals. And my book, Assassination Generation, asking what is the new factor worldwide? You know, when I when I present, I always throw up a, a picture of an M1 carbine, World War II military weapon, M1 carbine, 20, 30 round magazine, semi-automatic, six million of them were made in World War II. They flooded the market after World War II. The guns didn't change. Here's the point. High capacity magazine, semi-automatic military weapons, six million were made in World War II. The guns didn't change. We changed. Our mm -hmm. children changed. How's the gun control working out for Mexico? Yeah, how's that about Mexico? It's not about what's in their hand. It's about what's in their head and what's in their heart. Yeah. And the people have blood on their hands. My book, Assassination Generation, uh, the, the media, the, the movie industry, and especially the video game industry, which is enormously wealthy and, and, and powerful. They, they have blood on their hands and they continue to strive to, to, to sell the sickest stuff possible to our children. And, and, and we got to deal with that. Sleep deprivation. Here's parenting 101 for the 21st century. When you send your kid to bed at night, take their cell phone away from them. No cell phone in the room, no laptop in the room. They go to the room and sleep. Now realize teen suicides have exploded worldwide. Tweenagers, call them tweenagers, 10, 11, 12 year old. Teenage girls' suicide rate in America has tripled per capita in just the last decade. Mm. So, a cop came up to me during a break in one of my classes. He said, I had a good girl. He said she was an A student. She said, Dad, it's embarrassing. You don't have to take my cell phone every night. You can trust me. He said, so I trusted her. Let her keep her cell phone. Then a little while later, she took her life. He said, my little girl took her life. Uh -huh. he, said, he said, we never knew the hell she was living in until we looked at the text messages on her cell phone. Night after night of ceaseless, relentless, vicious bullying. And you can't just ignore that stuff. That's not how we're wired. She's up all night long trying to defend herself, trying to find somebody. To he says, I knew my little girl was bullied to death. What I didn't understand until now, she was sleep deprived, tortured, tormented, and bullied to death in front of my eyes. And I let it happen. Uh, I can't ignore that text message in the middle of the night. How can I expect our kids to? So I'm telling you, there's, there's, why isn't that information out there? Why aren't we told about the harmful effects, the sleep deprivation, the addictive nature of these video games? It's creating this culture of sleep deprivation worldwide and the prices we pay. You are in the middle of a battle against evil forces in our civilization who want to feed death and suffering to our children. In my book, Assassination Generation Again, has got more info if you're interested. I, I recommend it highly. And I will tell you, uh, you know, listen to that story. It just breaks my heart. But I will tell you that there is a bullying generation being cultivated within our profession as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, bluehelp.org does a phenomenal job logging um, the law enforcement suicides. And I think... A good portion of them are retirees because they they devote their life to this job and then the job ends and then they they feel like they have no purpose anymore. But I do feel a, a small portion of those suicides is the internal bullying within our profession. We eat our own um, in the law enforcement profession. It's terrible. It's, it's so terrible. Let's talk about that, Nick. All of you listeners out there, 
Don't be part of that bullying culture. But another angle on, on this, I want you to wrap your mind around. Uh, everybody, even you ladies out there, when we were kids, we paid toy guns at one time or another. We said, bang, bang, I got you. They said, no, you didn't. You smack it with your cap gun. It leaves a mark and they cry. If I gather on hurt kid and tries to convince him not to tell mom, somebody gets hurt, the play stops. Football game, basketball game, where players get hurt. The fans go silent, the play stops. In healthy play, whenever somebody gets hurt, the play stops. Kittens and puppies wrestle and, and mock play, but one of the puppies goes, arr, 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 and the puppy's hurt, and mom comes and checks it out. But the video games, you're rewarded for inflicting death and suffering. Yes. And the cell phones, you, you, you don't have to look at them. You will say things when you don't have to look at people you would never say face to face. So the video games reward you for inflicting vivid depictions in death and suffering. Does the play stop? Do you get in trouble? You get points. These are pathological play. This is dysfunctional play for children to be rewarded for inflicting death and suffering. And then you add to it this video, this cell phone culture, that the, the email culture in which we don't have to look in people's face. This study after study tells us that they will, they will text message a message across the cafeteria table saying vicious, evil things they would never look in their face and say. We are developing the, the technology mm -hmm. that developed a, a generation of bullies, not all of them, but a, a major minority have embraced this, this role of bullying. And it's got to be confronted at every level. Everybody involved says, no, what you did is not right. We can't eat our own like that. We can't be part of this culture. This is not right. You got away with that when you were a kid. You're not getting away with it here. We got to take that bullying dynamic and absolutely confront it. Yeah, and I, I would say social media specifically has has given a huge outlet to uh, anti-cop, anti-military, uh, Antifa, and all these keyboard warriors living in their mom's basements. Yeah, I uh, you know, and and. They're the ones that, you know, they're just in the face of uh, our law enforcement or our, or, or our military in these protests. And um, an angle on that, too. Um, they represent a, a surprisingly small minority. Mm -hmm. But the social media creates an echo chamber. I don't care what goofy, sick, perverted, nutty thing you believe in. You can find somebody online who agrees with you. Right. We'll all gather together. And they'll reinforce each other's belief policy. I, I believe that the portion of Antifa, the portion of, of these people are very small, but but they've been able to gather together. They've been able to advance their cause. They've been able to rally, and they found funding at the international level. Don't even get started with the money that Soros and others are pouring into this to destroy our culture and reinforce that, that mindset. But this echo chamber, which takes goofballs and pulls them all together and reinforces their belief structure, uh, and that's another toxic dynamic that's happening out there. And here's the poor cop on the beat who's just trying to save lives and 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 preserve civilization. We're being faced with a toxic culture and toxic times. And the only thing I can tell you is keep hanging in there. You know, I, I went back to the spiritual side of the thing, and and, and I found a verse that says it all. Uh, it's Amos five fifteen. Hate evil. You know, let's stop right there. Hate evil. God tells us there are things we should hate. The opposite of of the opposite of good, it, it, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is evil, and and, and, and the opposite of love is evil. And, and we're told to hate evil, and 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 and, and it, it, we love the person, but we, we hate acts of evil. We we should have a burning burning desire to confront evil and confront evil acts. Hate evil. Love good, maintain justice. Six words. Did I say it all? Eat evil, love good, maintain justice. Amos 5.15. Uh, no, right out of the Bible. And, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to have this burning need to confront evil and this, this love of what's good and strong and pure and this burning desire to maintain justice. And and this is what the sheepdogs, the cops are all about. Believe in who you are. Believe in what you do. We have never needed you like we need you now. This is your darkest hour, but it is also your finest hour. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. And your courage and your compassion and your competence shine bright for the darkness of the hour. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think 
right now, I think law enforcement as a whole needs to hear that. I think they're hearing um, agencies or a call for defunding of police. Um, as we're doing this interview last night, Sunday, uh, this interview will come out um, probably within a week or two after this news broke um, that uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota decided to their city council decided to defund uh, their police department. They have no idea what they're going to do. They have no idea what what plan is in place, but they're defunding the police department. Let's see how that works out. Yeah, exactly. Anarchy. Will and that's work. not going to agree your backlash of enormous magnitude. You can yeah. speak into the wind for a little bit. It's coming yeah. back at you. And, I, and, and they're doing it out of uh, political pressure because you have you're going to have to buy out these cops pensions. So the enormous amount of money that you're going to have to spend to buy these cops pensions out if you're going to dissolve the police, the police uh, department, they're they're leaving in record numbers because. Minneapolis Police Department officers, they know that the writing's on the wall. And oh, by the way, departments nationwide are hiring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, not yeah. Like, it's not like there's no jobs out there. Departments mm-hmm. nationwide are hiring. We're hurting for cops. We need good people. Yeah, we and that's that's a thing. Is, you see how that turns out? Yeah, yeah. And and in that surrounding area, um, I mean, these cops will be able to find a job. I just feel bad for them because they they got hired in an agency where they put their heart and soul into it. One incident happened. We get what happened. Um, my fear is, is that in the profession now, everything that's a administrative violation will turn into a criminal prosecution. And that's what I'm fr- afraid of for our profession, um, is that when you have a use of force that's justifiable use of force, but in the department's eyes is administrative violation, meaning that it's just a write up. The DAs and Commonwealth attorneys will be quick to convene grand juries to hem up these officers. And that creates a culture of, well, I'm just not going to get out of the car. I'm just not going to I'm not going to be proactive anymore. And that's where at the beginning of this episode, you said you're going to see crime spike uh, very, very shortly. We saw it in the Ferguson effect. We saw it in Baltimore. Yeah. Yep. It's coming. Yep. It's going to get worse. Yeah. But in the meanwhile, believe in who you are, believe in what you do. Yeah. As, you know, the, the worse it gets, the more important it is. And maybe move to somebody that truly appreciates you. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the future take its course in some of these cities. Move to, and like I said, they're, they're hiring everywhere. Move to somewhere that appreciates you. It's not a not a bad or unreasonable thing to do. But uh, but let, let nature take its course here and hang in there. Believe in who you are. Believe in what you do. As we love our family, you know, and I'll give you an angle on this, Nick. I tell all my audience, I'm 63 years old. It's uh, two months from now, I'll be 64th birthday. I've been doing this for, I uh, retired from the Army in, in 1997. I've been on the road, truly on the road, somewhere between two and 300 days a year. Uh, get home one or two nights a week, conjugal visit, clean underwear back on the road. And waiting, waiting at home for me is my bride of, of 44 years. How uh, just a, just a week from now, it will be uh, it will be forty five years. Oh, congrats! It's a sweetheart. She was uh, she was fifteen when I proposed to her. I tell people we are from Arkansas. <laughs> two years later, two years later, she married a crazy army paratrooper. Been this ride with me for forty five years. I love her more than life itself. Wow! And yet, for the last twenty three years, I truly have gotten home one or two nights a week and back on the road again. Because we both agree, the only people on earth more precious than, than my bride is my grandchildren. Mm-hmm. And if we love our children, if we love our grandchildren, we love our nation, we love our God, we're going to walk out that door and give 100%. And, and that's the nature of love. The, the, the nature of love is that the worse it gets, the more determined you are to give it all you got. Ain't nobody doing this job just for the money. Uh, they, they deserve to be paid a lot more. But if you're going in life, make a hell of a lot of money. You're in the wrong business. Yeah. At least legally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so why are you here? Yeah. Because you want to make a difference. Because you want to make a contribution. Because you know there's evil in the world. And you want to dedicate your life to making the world a better place. And so I tell everybody, you know, the, the thing about love is the worse it gets, the more determined we are to give it 100%. I, I throw up a picture in every class of a, of a California or of a, of a, 
a Port Authority officer on 9-11 coming down from the World Trade Center. His name is Christopher Amoroso. I really dig into that in this new book of mine on spiritual combat, about him and the name and on, uh, amazing guy. But his face is beat white. On the other side of the head, we know there's a pretty bad cut. He's been burned. There's a blow to the left cheekbone. But he's practically carrying down this pregnant lady whose face is beat red. Now, their heart rate could be exactly the same. The impact on their body is exactly the opposite. And she's experiencing vasodilation. He's experiencing vasoconstriction. His body has shut down the blood flow to the outer layer of the body to limit loss of blood. And, and we know when that happens, when the face goes white, is the blood drains from the face, the blood drains from the forebrain. There's no rational thought of that man's head. But I asked my audience, what makes him different than her? He's going back. Now, this will be his third trip up the World Trade Center. He's exhausted. He, his eyes are rolled up in his head. He's, he, his face is, is, is bone white. He has to physically shrug people off. He's a giant of a man to go back up that building one more time on just the remote chance to save one more life. So why does one person go toward the danger again and again when thousands are running away? Mm. And, and there's only one answer. In nature, the natural instinct of self-preservation is overcome with a mama critter. Many different species, a mama critter will die for her babies. Uh, in combat, soldiers die for each other. Audie Murphy, one of the most decorated American soldiers of World War II, was asked one time why he did it. His answer was very simple. They were killing my friends. And, and, and see, the mama critter loves her babies more than life itself. Audie Murphy loved his fellow soldiers more than life itself. And Christopher Amorosa loves his fellow citizens, men and women trapped in those towers, men and women jumping from, from, the, 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 from the floors, uh, 90 floors up, more than life itself. Now, here's the crazy part. The mama critter will die to save her babies. She won't die for anybody else's babies. We see in the Sheepdog Kids book, and I really recommend a Sheepdog kids book. And uh, uh, it's simple, but deep. We say the sheep will die to protect the ones they love. Only the sheepdog loves enough to die for other people's loved ones. Only the sheepdog loves enough to die for people they don't even know. But here's the key point. It said they're not heroes because they die. They're heroes because they walk out the door every day prepared to lay down their life. And here's my, 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 my critical point to all the people out there. Sometimes the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. Mm. The place of welfare of others, head of your own. To walk out the door every day of your life. To do a dirty, dangerous, thankless job. To the utmost of your ability every day of your life, because you know, if nobody did it, our civilization would no longer exist. Not to sacrifice your life. But to live a life of sacrifice. For most of us, therein lies the greatest love. And at the end, there is no greater motivation in life than love for our children, love for our community, love for our family, love for our nation, love for our God. And as we love those, those precious entities, we walk out that door and give it all we got every day. Wow, that's amazing. And um, I'm going to close out with that. And we are going to do a part two to this uh, this interview. It's just so powerful that. Um, I think to do justice, I think uh, we need to do two parts. Dave, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, folks that are listening, uh, stay tuned. The following week, we'll release part two. Uh, you can get a hold of me at nick at rollcallroom.com. Dave, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, in you know, uh, at killology.com. We're rebranding. Killology was intentionally provocative, a book on killing, but we're rebranding, and uh, but right now, Killology.com, K-I-L-L-O-L-O-G-Y. All my speaking engagements are there. All of my books are there, links to everything else. Uh, I also have, a, 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 my son and I have a gun store, uh, it, a, a gun manufacturing FFL, actually. We, we knock out a handful of custom 1911s a month, uh, sheepdogknifeandgun.com, sheepdogknifeandgun.com. Nationwide, uh, gun stores are out of guns. We've we got a good stock in <laughs> And I'm telling you, we're getting off the ground. We're selling four thousand dollar 1911s for less than two grand as we wow. get these around. They're, they're the last of the Daytonics. We bought the last of the slides and frames from Daytonics. They're the first of the new sheepdog guns. There'll only be about sixty of these first run of guns ever made. Uh, instant collectibles, and uh, so you know, I got I got so many irons in the fire. Yeah, you do. 
and speaking engagements, my books, uh, new books coming out, new books in the pipeline. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, sheepdogknifeandgun.com. On the other hand, uh, we got some patented editions. We're putting our guns and people really love it. All right, it's the worst of times. It's the best of times. It's times when people uh, need our sheepdogs. We need our warriors. You will see the nation rally around these things. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I tell you, I, I always try to, on every podcast, to honor you and honor the people who are listening. You know, I've been on 60 Minutes and 2020 and Larry King, and, and they don't amount to a, to, to a hill of beans. A week later, nobody cares, and nobody even knows it happened. If you're lucky, you get five minutes, to, and they decide what you get to say. There has always been a barrier against what I call citizen journalism. There were three networks and, uh, you know, and a couple of radio stations and, and two newspapers and, uh, and maybe 20 nationwide periodicals. And that's all there was. And if you wanted to get a national voice, that's the only way to do it. Now we've broken through the barrier. You are giving deeper information and you who listen are seeking deeper information. It's one of the great things happening in our civilization right now is these podcasts giving deeper information and seeking deeper info. Nick, I honor you and I, all you listeners out there, stay in touch with Nick at, uh, at uh, roll call, uh, at rollcallroom.com and, and keep seeking deeper knowledge and, and, and believe in who you are and believe in what you do. Awesome. All right, folks. Um, thank you again for tuning in. Reach me at Nick at rollcallroom.com or check out rollcallroom.com and stay tuned for part two. Law enforcement officers are dying at an alarming rate, not at the hands of criminals, but at their own hands, leaving loved ones to pick up the pieces, leaving our brothers and sisters lost, leaving them praying for answers, leaving them praying for someone to do something. We are hurting. We are struggling. We are demanding answers and change. We are the public's guardians and protectors. Now, for the first time, someone is speaking up. From the creators of the Roll Call Room podcast comes peer support training for law enforcement. This training will define our legacy as a profession and change the stigma about mental health in law enforcement. This training will hopefully stop the epidemic of suicides in our profession. <laughs>